Okay. Um, so I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Dr. Delish Clare, and you're all very welcome to this meeting. This is a first venture for us, so here's hoping for the thumbs up. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is bitter medicines. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me, my background is as a general practitioner. And um, I trained in University College Dublin um, 30, almost 30 years ago. And um, I'm also teach clinical medical students in NUIG Medical School. And my background is that I have a science degree in herbal medicine from the Middlesex University in the UK. So I'm fascinated by um, patients, patient care, and at the core of, of, of this, I would say, there's a very big role for using bitter medicines. If we can get to the next slide. Okay, here we go. Over the 30 years, um, I, I would make a prediction that poor vagal tone is going to be the next adrenaline insufficiency. So you've heard it here first. Um, uh, over 30 years, I've seen the lingua franca change from post-viral fatigue, myalgia encephalitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, candidiasis, um, chronic Lyme disease, uh, leaky gut, and the most recent is uh, adrenal insufficiency. These are all things that our patients describe. They're all symptom-based. They do have anomalies of physiology, um, none of which adds up to a core um, a structural diagnosis, which is very frustrating for our patients because their world certainly is um, very unmanageable. And I would describe the core physiology for all of these syndromes um, as a wobbly physiology, or where the physiology with all of its cascades um, of biochemistry is acting as though um, we, we are living in an unsafe world if we suffer from any of these conditions. Um, herbal medicine it goes back a lot long, longer than the lingua franca of the last 30 years in describing these conditions. Um, and if I was a herbalist 100 years ago, I'd be talking about digestion. If I was a herbalist 1,000 years ago, I'd be talking about digestion. And if I was a herbalist 3,000 years ago, anywhere in the world, it's a universal um, system. To put in perspective, pharma medicine um, and the science associated with it is 300, 350 years since it, it emerged um, from the Enlightenment, or the so-called Enlightenment and rationalist um, philosophy. Uh, so most of the drugs that have come from that have evolved over the last hundred years and I really wonder how many of those we'll be using in a hundred years or a thousand years. Um, when I was in, in clinical medicine as a general practitioner I had a herbalist teach me, Andrew Chevalier, in my practice and after about eight or nine months of seeing my own general practice patients I, I got terribly frustrated um, because everything that he was doing, no matter whether my patients had migraine, leaky gut, or chronic fatigue, or um, it would have been called at the time, or myalgia encephalitis, he seemed to treat the digestion. And he nodded very patiently and said, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> I think he had an idea that I just might um, make uh, have the makings of a medical herbalist, even if I was a bit of a slow learner. So I've since learned the, the, the wisdom of his words, the universality of the approach, the history um, has confirmed everything that he was nodding patiently about. So the webinar, um, when I timed it, was about 40, um, at most 50 minutes long. And what I want to do is introduce you to the worlds of bitters. Um, some of you may know that I have a range of blended herbs which are available to the, to, the, to the public because this is our indigenous medicine. I feel very strongly that people should be um, able to use medicinal herbs to help with their um, medical problems, um, particularly ones that are suitable for over-the-counter remedies, but many others that are suitable in conjunction with uh, professional opinions for whether people are attending 
um, for energy medicine or acupuncture or various other. And these would be our traditional, what I call classical herbal medicine. Um, it's been, been termed Western herbal medicine, but I think the uh, classical herbal medicine um, is much more descriptive because it goes back to its origins in Greece in, and Rome, um, preceded by uh, Arabic and Persian experience, very much in parallel with Yunani Tib medicine in Asia. But the specific blends that, that I'll talk about in more detail at the end of the presentation, when you understand why they have these, um, the, these effects of the blends, is Dr. Clare's Detox Blend, otherwise known as Dr. Clare's Bitters, Dr. Clare's Chamomile and Lemon Balm Blend, otherwise known as Digestive Tonic Blend, Dr. Clare's Black Walnut and Gentian or Parasite Blend, and Dr. Clare's Dock and Chamomile Blend, otherwise known as a Laxative Blend. And I'll also talk about um, uh, hidden on the bottom here is uh, marshmallow and slippery elm. I don't know whether we can lose this. Can we just so we can see, we'll see the bottom? We'll play around with this a little bit. Thanks. So, um, what what is the? Uh, I think Susan really needs to come in. Sorry. What is the um, core value of herbs? Hello to any newcomers. We'll get back, is to go with the gut. The vagus nerve is the longest cranial nerve in the body. It meanders um, from the digestion to the all through um, below the diaphragm, um, up through the thorax, all the way up, um, meeting the brain stem and making connections in the midbrain and eventually the prefrontal front the frontal cortex. It has two aspects of it, and this kind of science has only realized this within the last 25 years. Um, it has a slow lane of unmyelinated nerves, which are below the diaphragm. And this involves a massive sensory, visceral, um, digestive, predominantly digestive um, feedback into the central nervous system. So it, it, it's, a, it's a, a constant monitoring system of everything that's happening in the visceral organs. There's also a fast lane of about 15%, um, which uh, serves the, uh, the organs, the visceral organs in the thorax, which is the heart and um, breathing of the respiratory tract. So the slow lane is the snail's pace and the fast lane is the cheetah. Oh, thanks. Um, so the uh, servicing the visceral organs in the thorax goes to the heart of the matter. Um, this is where we need our immediate reactions to how we feel in terms of threat or safety. And this is expressed and it can explain, it can measure the vagal tone by heart rate variability. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. This is the polyvagal theory. Um, it was uh, evolved um, along with heart rate variability by Stephen Porges. Um, and uh, it's, it, it describes the physiology of emotions. So our day-to-day -day, uh, managing of our emotions goes from um, the lovely couple on the left who show um, delight, affection, closeness, physical contact, amazement, um, but I think intimacy, history, and uh, closeness. So you can just, the, the oxytocin is, is oozing. Um, the poor woman on the right could be reacting to her children just refusing to put their Wellingtons on on a wet day, a traffic jam, intense grief, um, uh, bad news um, about a relative. It could be... Um, uh, a, a, a range. Sorry, that's it now. Too. That, that's as many as we'll admit. Great. Just point. Okay. Sorry, do it. So these are the range of emotions on a day-to-day -day basis that we can all identify with. It should be said that this percentage, perception of whether the world is an unsafe place that we express a lot of anger and tension about, it could be in relation to something major or something minor. Our vagus nerve actually can't tell the difference. Um, the intensity of our emotions is in response to all kinds of factors. 
um, the fact that it is intense is, is an, an expression of vagal tone. So we have a, a rapid rate um, reflex uh, reptilian um, effect. This is, I hope that very few of us will need to use this any time in our lives. But I know that I certainly have had patients who have had experiences where they needed this um, or when it, it just happened, this fight, flight or freeze. Um, the freeze is a rapid red light, involuntary, unsurmountable um, response, which thankfully is rare unless we're in a domestically, domestic war or a political war zone. Um, and unfortunately, many people are, are, are unlucky enough to that that's their experience. So the life or death rare reflex ultimate threat to survival leaves us freezing. Um, like this uh, reptile um, and our, our breathing is so shallow it's not noticeable our heart rate slows down and it's an absolute survival mechanism so if patients have a, a post-traumatic um, reaction whereby they're feeling very bad about um, not not speaking, screaming, running, um, they can be very reassured. I've had patients whose lives have changed because of explaining this, so that's why I've done it in some detail. So that's the old brain limbic system extreme circumstances. However, most of our day-to-day -day, um, cognitive functions, new brain, cortex, frontal cortex, is the physiology, sorry about the spelling, I missed that one on my revision, the physiology of the daily range of emotions. So that's tuned into facial expressions, intonation of the voice, whether it's high and squeaky, whether it's low and growly, whether it's slow, whether it's fast, um, all of the modulations of the voice, hearing low frequency sounds, which is a reflection of our focus, concentration, and ability to actually take in our environment and tension of the neck muscles. Um, so this is the physiology of the emotions of how we live our lives. Sorry, this is a little bit blurry, but for those who are uh, visual learners, this shows the connections to the facial nerve of facial expressions. Um, uh, top uh, at uh, 10 o'clock. Um, 11 o'clock is the visual um, stimuli uh, where we can see other people's facial expressions and react to what, react to them um, by the optic nerve. Um, this one is the uh, sense of smell and that has a very direct imminent effect on all the brain chemistry. The trigeminal nerve again and um, facial expression. The autopharyngeal nerve which is the vocal intonation, um, the neck muscle tension, and all of the visceral organs above the diaphragm and below the diaphragm. So these, this is how we live our lives on a daily basis. This is how our patients experience their lives. So whether, whether this physiology is happy or unhappy, um, the core effects is of an unhappy vagal tone, is difficulty speaking or loss of voice, a voice that's hoarse or wheezy, uh, trouble drinking liquids or loss of the gag reflex, pain in the ear, which has no explainable reason. Patients who have been to the ear, nose and throat, everybody has said everything is structurally fine. An unusual heart rate. This is the patients who find that they get palpitations after they go to bed at night when everything is calm and they're moving from uh, a highly tuned sympathetic tone um, and the autonomic um, system is the calm and uh, relaxed. So to go from one to the other is a bit of a, uh, a jump. Um, you, you also get that when people, when they go to bed and they have a, a like a startle reaction. And it's because their muscles are so tight and they, in order to be anesthetized in sleep, they have to ha. Ah. And that jump is too, too big to make um, without a, a shudder, if you like, as a, as a kind of an accelerated relaxation. Abnormal blood pressure, so all of your patients who have high blood pressure, labile and react to stressful and emotional situations, there's a big role for the vagal nerve. Decreased production of stomach acid, and I think most of nutritionists would agree that a lot of problems are uh, reflux symptoms, which are actually because of low defenses rather than higher expression of stomach acid. Um, 
So nausea and vomiting and abdominal pain or bloating. So an awful lot of the issues to do with irritable bowel syndrome. Gastroparesis, um, it's reckoned now that 1.8% of the US population has gastroparesis, which is um, in, in, inadequate emptying of the stomach um, due to poor tone and poor um, muscle co and nerve coordination. And the symptoms of this are nausea and vomiting, especially vomiting undigested food hours after eating. I mean, that's just that the, 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 the stomach just doesn't have the energy to keep passing it on. Loss of appetite or coordination. Loss of appetite or feeling full shortly after starting a meal. Again, very common. Acid reflux um, or what feels like acid reflux. Abdominal pain or bloating. Unexplained weight loss and fluctuations in blood sugar. The, the other um, uh, lingua franca in vogue was hypoglycemia. Um, for, for, for that was kind of considered a, um, another one of these diagnoses of poor physiology. So your patient comes to you expressing how safe they feel in the world and the way they express it is through their symptoms. How they perceive the world is not debatable or conscious. It's influenced by a totality of their experiences going back to childhood, um, all of their previous medical experiences. Their symptoms are a way of, uh, of the body saying to you, I don't feel safe. How can you make me more safe? It's predictable from adverse events in childhood, and there's a link there. Um, you can all check your own score in terms of adverse um, events in childhood. Uh, a huge um, uh, follow-on effect with a high score of chronic ill health in middle age. Um, so that's why it's so important to actually ask about childhood experiences. Influenced by environment. As I say, the traffic jam, the children not putting on the Wellingtons, um, the toxins, uh, the electric light, which means that we're awake long after lamplight, um, the food that we eat, um, which it's just harder and harder to find food that's um, uh, fit for purpose, really. Um, and the, 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 the influences are on satiety. Um, people who have poor vagal tone don't know when they're full. Um, all of the addictions, which is about the big hole in our life, which is um, uh, whether it's behavioral addictions or substance addictions, um, many of, of our patients and many of us will have um, go-tos for self-soothing. And what we're soothing is our vagus nerve environment. Um, social connections, intimacy, and breathing. Um, I've highlighted breathing because um, low vagal tone, just moving this across so I can read it myself, index. Um, and you, you can tell what your, your vagal tone is by how graceful you are under pressure. Um, if you're somebody who can manage, manage pressure um, very gracefully, um, well, you're very lucky. <laughs> Low vagal tone is linked with inflammation, negative moods, loneliness, and heart attacks. Um, all of the features of performance anxiety are um, a direct mirror or, or reflection of um, vagal tone. So what we're aiming for, it's always nice to have a positive image of what we're aiming for. Um, and grace under pressure, I think, is a very good um, it means that we've got some reserves in our tank, some resilience. Um, but a state of well-being is a state of good vagal tone. That'll be again. Um, if you wanted to measure it, it's measurable in the heart rate variability as described by Stephen Porges. And it's the variability from um, beat to beat versus the rate. The rate is just counting the number per minute. This is the variability from beat to beat and it, it, it's a very accurate reflection. Some practitioners do um, train and uh, use this as a tool for teaching people how to manage um, uh, stress and to enhance their resilience. Um, I find that patients, patients tell you in their own facial expressions, in the symptoms that they have, um, in feeling their pulse, looking at their tongue, um, it's it, it, seeing whether their face is expressive, seeing what the light is in their eyes. Um, but heart rate, some, some patients love a, 
a, a, a picture and scientific evidence and something to aim for. And for those patients, having a scale like heart rate va variability um, is very good. Um, this is the polyvag. This is all based on the polyvagal theory, theory, which was um, uh, put forward by Stephen Porges over 25 years ago. He initially put forward the heart rate variability and followed that with the polyvalent vagal theory. Um, the emotional aspects of this, and because it fits in so well with post-traumatic stress disorder, if you look up some of the um, YouTubes and books um, of Dr. Gabor Mate, he's very inspiring in, in this whole area. But uh, that's all very well to describe problems, but I'm very much solution-based. So um, one of the solutions, of course, is optimum building blocks, such as food. Um, so, the, and, and I'm, you know, past all of this expertise, this is where you come in, but you will notice that our patients don't come with magnesium deficiency. They don't come with low iodine. They don't come with even low iron unless it shows up in a blood test. These are the solutions that are based on, but good food makes a huge difference to the expression of these symptoms. If we don't have good food, we are much more likely to fall into a poor vagal tone. Um, I mean, undoubtedly. So you need optimum food in order to be a picture of health. So we need to, um, we can't go back and change our adverse childhood circumstances. We can't instantly build a safe, soothing, nourishing um, world of empathy. Um, but there are some ways, in the same way that if you laugh, you change, you probably change your, your vagal tone, but if you laugh, you fool your brain chemistry into thinking you're happy even if it's not a very good joke. It's actually the laughing that actually does the changes. So there's three, three ways, I might even add four, which would be laughing. Um, so the building blocks are good food, laughing, good sleep, all of the things that you, you include in your own practices. But specifically bitters, breathing and aromatherapy, I would say have direct, direct frontline, um, no meandering, they, they definitely go straight to the heart of vagal tone. Um, bitters, I particularly refer people to buteco breathing, mainly because Patrick McKeown from Moycullen is up the road and I've sent various patients complaining of anxiety who are over conscientious with what I want them to do. They actually need to breathe. They're not getting the proper oxygenation um, and giving them more instructions and, and even medicine is only part of the, the answer. Um, so that's the one that I refer to. There are various yoga breathing. Um, and I do a lot of breathing exercises with patients in the clinic where I get them to just And that breath in is lovely. Um, that's also very good for when people are crying inconsolably and you, you actually want to move beyond the crying so that you can implement some solutions for them. Um, so it's, it, and, and teaching them that can be very helpful in managing their emotions um, because our emotions are very important to express them, but it's also very important to move beyond them and onto the solutions. So bitters does that directly and the aromatherapy through the olfactory nerve um, is another way, particularly for families that are in distress and for multi-generational trauma. Um, it's, it's very, very helpful. So we'll go on to explain why. So we're talking about the physiology of safety and safety is a moving target. Um, it just won't stand still. It's rolling, it's subtle, it's complex, it's matrix. Not only is it 360 degrees, it's 360 degrees in all directions. It's labyrinthine. It involves overlapping regulatory systems and it, they, they just add and build. Um, and this includes the hormone, uh, immune, neurochemical, um, and also how we produce and manage toxins um, is, plays, is a very important role as well. Um, and of course, um, detoxing via the liver and bile is an important part of managing um, the toxins in our body. So the food provides building blocks. Herbs provide food and healing. And the, the link between, again, between herbs that are foods and herbs that are healing is very, uh, very close. And sometimes it's the dose. 
sometimes with herbs a smaller dose has a stronger effect sometimes you need a bigger dose um, and and what works the reason why herbs work is because of the secondary metabolites produced produced by the plants that enhance healing um, the role that we, we that play we play within nature is one of coevolution. You you understand how we need vitamins and minerals from to be taken in, externally in our foods. That's because we've outsourced vitamin and mineral um, uh, uh, our requ requirements are filled by the food that we eat, um, and these are plentiful and, uh, and and available if we eat unprocessed good foods. Um, there is a theory that we are, have also outsourced many um, herbal constituent actions or whole plant actions even more specifically because that's how we eat the herbs um, because they have healing properties. And these would include bitters and antiseptics in particular. Um, so that would be uh, an important um, concept to, to think about. So we're interdependent on nature um, without uh, having the, 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 the herbs and the plants and particularly the greens, um, we don't thrive. So the secondary metabolites are constituents in the herbs where they react to adversity in their own growing circumstances. For instance, they produce antifungals, they produce antivirals because they need them for themselves. And we realized that the plants over thousands of years were producing these so we could outsource those actions. So healing, bitters, astringency, um, antiseptics, all of these um, actions we've, we've possibly um, outsourced. So that's why the herbal medicine um, is universal, indigenous, and plays such a big part in ecological and sustainable medicine. So we'll go on to specifically bitters. Bitters stimulate glandular activity and the stomach acid. Um, herbs act as amphoterics, which is if the stomach acid is normal, it won't stimulate it. It'll only stimulate stomach acid if it's low. Um, so uh, herbs act, interact very intelligently with us to normalize our homeostasis. They don't give a stimulatory um, kick in the ass if you're already producing your own um, uh, acid. It's a tonic stimulant to the stomach and the gut in general. It's stim bitters stimulate bile flow and pancreas secretions, hence the um, stabilizing of the uh, oral uh, glycemia. Uh, overlapping effects, for example, herbs don't, bitters don't just come by themselves. They're uh, in a whole plant and they, or another action of that plant might be an astringent or a diuretic. And that's part of the art of choosing the right um, mm. bitters for our for our patients or to suit a general population so in addition to that in addition to these local effects they stimulate the vagus nerve but what's very interesting recently in science is they stimulate visceral and brain which are non-taste good bitter receptors so we'll go on to that a little bit later um, i thought you might like a little bit of science so that you know i'm not just making all this up as I go along, foods containing secondary plant metabolites elicit autonomic gut and cardiovascular system responses. So there you have it. It indicates how our exposed homeostatic and circulatory systems um, respond to dietary compounds as well as other substances formed in the gut, either during digestion of foods or by the microbiota. So I'm sure this is no surprise to you um, as nutritionists. Bitters and foods and medicines are an example of such effects. They elicit autonomic gut and cardiovascular responses. Fascinating, isn't it? So bitter principles are, um, are the, 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 the chemical compounds that have an effect um, that we determine as a bitter taste. There are hundreds of these bitter principles. Many alkaloids are bitter, for example, caffeic acid in coffee, but they're not limited to any one chemical category. Um, so they're, 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 they're difficult to put in one particular box. They can be terpenes, alkaloids, tannins, etc. Um, an example of the complexity of effect, as I say, is that the tannins offer bitterness and astringency. So they might be particularly good for leaky gut. Um, 
so there's a lot that we don't know about bitters, but we do know that this is some of the facts that we do know. Bitters bind to bitter taste bud receptors. They couple with G proteins, which initiates a cascade, which results in the sensation of bitterness um, in our mouths. There's 40 to 80 different types of bitter receptors. Children are more than adults, which may be why they dislike vegetables and strong tastes. And there's a lot of gene variation. Um, uh, so that's, that's um, my children just took a long time to get used to eating anything like savory stuff. And I go to other people's places and there's the children eating olives and smoked salmon. Um, so there's a lot of ge genetic variation as well. The life cycle of taste buds is 10 to 14 days. So here's what I'm passionate about. This is some of the bitter herbs. Many, many more herbs have bitters um, as, a, as like a minor tone but these ones would be um, bitter herbs with a major tone. So Artemisia, I'm, I'm going to say them out because I, I just love the sound of all of this. Artemisia, Carduus or milk thistle, and then afterwards I'll group them together. Erythrea or Centauri, Gentian, Cumulus or Hops, Menanthes or Bog Bean, Chicory, Dandelion, uh, Horehound, Quinine Bark, Achillea, Acorus Calamus, Chamomile, Verbena, Berberus, uh, Pumus, uh, Doc, Golden Seal, Angelica, Archangelica, and Momordia Charantia. Sorry, that's a bit blocked at the end. That's bitter melon. So why would I choose which herbs where? Um, well, the milk thistle and the dandelion root I nearly always prescribe together because they both have an effect on liver enzymes and on production and release of bile, but the milk thistle is more enzymatic. Um, uh, oh, okay, um, somebody's asked a question, so we'll deal with that at the end if that's okay, if you can bear with me. So erythrea um, uh, and chamomile would go together because they're very gentle. I would use those in children and in 80 or 90 year olds. Uh, very, very gentle. Um, chamomile is brilliant because as we've seen before, we've seen it has so many other effects. Um, uh, digestive for things like irritable, irritable bowel, diverticulosis would be archangelica, chamomile uh, and artemisia. Um, in, a, in a much more debilitated patient it would be erythrea rather than the artemisia. The whorehound is a very very useful herb because it is uh, an expectorant so it's a cooling um, expectorant uh, with a, a bitter um, it kind of really gives a kick to the digestive system, um, which is, can sometimes be very useful. Sometimes people need a kick in the digestive system in order to um, push ahead with the healing response. So particularly useful for deep, very persistent cough. I often see people who've been on three antibiotics before they come and see me, and, and that's like a, a very resistant um, and irritated, so I would I would use whorehound in that situation. Queen I knew all probably know from um, treating malaria, very very bitter. Um, so golden seal and berberus, um, antiseptic. Um, the berberines would would have a, a, a bitter effect, uh, and the other constituents would have a very strong effect on the immune system, particularly for sinusitis and for chest infections. Um, the Memordia is uh, particularly good for stabilizing blood sugars as a bitter, um, and uh, very commonly eaten as a food in Asia. Um, and the Asian population have a particular um, preponderance for diabetes mellitus. Um, like, but like all over the world, the industrialized um, diet is, is making the use of this much, much less, and the diabetes is, is shooting up in the Asian population, even in Asia, uh, but also relevant to our Asian population here. So I think that gives you, the Achillea is particularly good for pelvic congestion um, and for fevers. So uh, I use it particularly nice for um, uh, polycystic ovary, uh, ovarian syndrome. So um, I think that gives a, an overview. Um, I mean, I love talking about these bitters. I could talk, talk about them all day. I prescribe them all day as well. So, but this is what you want to hear about, which is what, what foods can we give our patients um, that to encourage them to eat. Um, good luck, very difficult to get people to eat these. Chicory, 
um, coffee, dandelion leaf, um, and root. The root can be made into dandelion coffee, but you have to um, buy the roast. You can roast it yourself, but it needs to be ground into a powder, um, and it's it's time consuming. Uh, be careful, a lot of the products have sugar added if they're the instant dandelion um, root coffee. Endive and romaine lettuce and radicchio. Ganoderma mushrooms have a bitter triterpene, um, and the bitters might be anti-tumor as well as the polysaccharides in it. Bitter orange peel is also rich in iron. I use it in my iron tonic. Apricot kernels, um, the difficulty with those is um, sourcing them um, uh, organically or in a way that you can guarantee that they don't have um, contamination. And bitter melon. Um, I haven't seen that for sale here. Um, you, it might be available in some of the uh, Asian um, food shops, but I haven't seen them in Galway. Um, guidelines, um, according to traditional practice, the only one that there's a limitation on is using Artemisia for more than six weeks at a time. Um, up, up to about 10 years ago, there were reports of neurotoxicity, which have proved unworthy of truth, which I think is a very nice way of saying um, that we can rule that issue out. Traditional practice, though, dictates that after about six weeks, you would take one to two um, weeks break. Um, this is sustainable for a cycle of 12 weeks. If it's still having problems, see a herbalist. Use the other blends for 12 weeks. Refer to a herbalist if not responding. And that's just a pragmatic. Um, you know, it, it, it's a, these are general blends suitable for 70 to 80% of the general population. But if your patient isn't responding, then um, I would suggest referring to a herbalist. In general, I think an association, a reciprocal association between a herbalist and nutritionist is um, very, very useful. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so the bitter science only gets better. Um, the, the first um, uh, uh, Adage was described as oriental medicine, but I think it's actually universal, where good medicine always tastes, tastes bitter. Um, and uh, this was from a research article stating that it may soon be verified by modern biology. But what my patients say in, in Galway, and I think it's, it's it, throughout Ireland, because none of us are that far away from the land, if it tastes this bad, it must be good for you. Um, the bitter receptors are found, obviously, in the digestive tract but not just in the mouth, all along the digestive tract. They're also, um, science is now show, showing, found in the immune system, the respiratory system, the genital urinary system, and the brain. So, and there, and there is a, a, a thought that we should actually rename them because these are not only influencing the gastrointestinal tract. Um, the, which is no surprise to herbalists because we didn't describe them just for digestive tonics, they were always prescribed as general tonics, not just specific to the digestive tract. So the extra, or, extra oral uh, TR2s, which is one kind of receptor, will be attractive targets for new medicines, and that currently used bitter medicines may exert their pharmacological functions by acting on these extra oral receptors, which until now have been considered side effects or adverse effects. So nearly all pharmaceutical medicines are bitter. If they gave the pharmaceuticals in tinctures, they wouldn't be, they, they would be even more unpalatable than nature's bitters. So, which is also very interesting. So it looks like we're going back to the future because with this knowledge we may one day, we may one day understand the true biological basis through which bitter herbs can act. Um, I love the note of surprise in these articles. Um, and to me, it doesn't actually matter a huge amount. I love science. I think it adds an extra twist. But my practice of herbal medicine is based on traditional indications and um, traditional use over thousands of years. Because it will take that the science happens in there's this bit of knowledge, this bit of knowledge, this bit of knowledge, this bit of knowledge. You put those two bits of knowledge and you come up with this conclusion. And then you have to fit it into the chemicals that we already know. And we hate things like bitter principles because they don't fit into any particular chemistry. So medicine, herbal medicine is complex. Our, our physiology is complex. And it's the magic of fitting the two in 360 degrees in all directions, which appeals to me as a medical herbalist. And the science is just 
isn't it nice that it, that it validates what we've been known and how we've been using these medicines. Um, so, let me just see what's up there. Functional bitter taste receptors are expressed in the brain cells. So they, again, that's just to show that I'm not making it up. <laughs> you can read that. Um, so taste issues. And again, there's a little bit too much detail in this, but um, basically, uh, this is this is the, the taste receptors depend on us being able to use them but in fact for various conditions there may be inflammatory cascades likely to protect for mouth pathogens bacteria and viruses that actually destroy our taste um, uh, sometimes temporarily rarely permanently um, but can uh, uh, upset our taste buds. Smoking can have an effect on reducing our taste buds as well. And this can have a substantial negative impact on general health and the quality of life. Um, particularly watch out for anorexia, malnutrition and depression. And with cancer and autoimmune conditions, taste abnormalities are associated with poor outcomes. I've lost you. How do I go back? Okay, okay. Another one, there we go. So, uh, but, and it's just to say that um, in spite of clinical significance, they actually know very little about specific treatment for taste loss, which is why the bitters are, I mean, I have found them to be extremely helpful in patients with uh, a metallic taste, with um, uh, poor taste, uh, people who, uh, their food just tastes like sawdust. It's a very strong stimulus. Um, so it's like if they're if they've got 60 70 percent of their taste buds knocked knocked out believe me the bitters might get to the 20 or 30 percent that are that are left um, so very very useful so i was talking about the, the the complexity of the plant constituents and also the terrain of our patients and ourselves terrain is the complex subtle matrix within which food herbs supplements and toxins find their substrates we're tuned into our surroundings to normalize the terrain. So we do everything we can to balance our homeostasis. Primates have instinctual, instinctual knowledge of what to eat for parasites. They've actually done studies to see what, what um, apes eat, why they eat it, and studied their stools um, and looked at the excretion. Um, uh, they've also looked at the terrain of wild animals um, and tamed animals in a zoo. And the difference in their microbiome of wild animals and tamed animals, I leave you to consider which modern industrial society is more similar to. Is it to wild animals um, or to animals in a zoo, which is impoverished? It's, it's a fraction of the diversity that you'll find in wild animals. So I think I've just given it away, haven't I? <laughs> so we are all living in the human zoo, if you like, um, in current industrial um, societies. Um, which is, it's interesting that there are bitter receptors in the reproductive organs because a huge impact of industrial living is a massive reduction in um, sperm counts in men. So it doesn't, again, it's another indication to me that of, of not being surprised to find that there are um, bitter receptors in the genital urinary system. Um, herbal medicines are universal. Kew botanists, uh, this is Kew Gardens in the UK, study 20,000 phylogenetically classified plants. Um, the same plant species were found to be effective for the same conditions in independent um, traditional medicine systems. So they all e e emerged in their culture and environment absolutely independent of each other. And the same plant, plant groups were found to be effective for the same conditions in all the different traditions. Um, the ones particularly studied were New Zealand, Nepal, South Africa, and indigenous North American medicine traditions. So the concept of terrain explains how complex herbs have such diverse actions and we, we take something as simple as chamomile it's anti-inflammatory relaxing nervine which is a tonic, a tonic support for the nervous system healing the herbal term is vulnerable antimicrobial antispasmodic and um, digestive and bile stimulating i have to say when i first came across all of this when i was studying herbal medicine i was like 
not impressed. <laughs> I, was, I couldn't think of any physiology, but mind you, I had forgotten all my physiology because it had been 20 years since I'd studied that. So I just downright didn't believe it. Um, I thought it was very fanciful. Um, but the annoying thing about it was that my patients kept coming back and saying, you know what, Dr. Clare, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I just generally feel better. Um, and and that's, that's what they come for. They, they, they come to feel better. Um, so the effect on the vagus nerve alone serves many of these actions. So bitter's physiology crosses all the lines, all the lines that I couldn't make sense of of my patient's story. There you go, bitter physiology crosses all of these lines. Um, and just in case I came across this little um, tidbit, nit, nit bit, whatever, the use of chamomile tea relieves colic in 57% of affected babies. So if you have a colicky baby, you'll be very glad you tuned in. Otherwise, you can recommend chamomile tea, one teaspoon per, per day for infants, um, and 56% uh, is, and it was a good study, um, so yeah. So medicine goes by tradition and uh, history, tradition and trends, tonics to vitamins. Um, Berberis containing berberines used to be taken as a bitter tonic, it went out of fashion and it's now being reinvented as vagal tonics. So what we recommend to people is, is, is it's what's fashionable, trendy, and at the moment scientism is what's trendy. Um, if you can explain it by a scientific principle, you're in. Um, but uh, the scientific principles, as I say, are quite limited, um, but we love them. So now we're going back to the beginning. This is what we set out to do. Um, Dr. Clare, me, has a range of blends which are particularly suited to low vagal tone. Um, the fact is that they are also very useful for any of the other descriptions, chronic Lyme, leaky gut in particular, candidiasis in particular, fibromyalgia in particular. So suitable for all of these things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, going to go through the herbs that are in the blend. And in red, I have identified which are the bitters. Um, so in the detox bitter blend, as you can imagine, there's a number of bitters. So dandelion root, milk thistle, silver birch, um, which is, it's not butter, it's bitter and astringent, um, and gentian, which is one of the most cooling of bitters. Um, so backing that up, and so that it's actually palatable, because that's very important as well, is meadowsweet, which is a stomachic and salicylic acid um, rich uh, herb, which is good for pain and discomfort of any, any kind. Peppermint, which is antispasmodic for the gut, um, and ginger, which is warming to balance the cooling of the gentian, and also antispasmodic um, for the gastrointestinal tract. So the, it, who is this one? I'm going to concentrate a little bit extra on this one because this is actually the bitters blend. So when you have patients who have a sluggish digestion, um, you want to re-educate their bitter receptors because they're craving sugar. Um, they have food addictions or cravings, particularly of the sweet variety. They have a, a puffy look to their, their face um, and a puffy, you know, their, their rings are tight, um, uh, often exacerbated before a period. Um, so bluffy, puffy, bloated, uh, tight rings, uh, swollen tongue um, with the taste bud prominent. Um, tongue may be pale with indentations along either side. Um, which shows poor tone in the, the colon. Um, they describe a particular kind of sluggish fatigue. They can do everything. They're not limited in what they can do, but there's no, I'll do that now. That's a great thing to do. There's a, there's a once they get going, they're fine, but they, they find it very hard to actually motivate and get going. Um, the, the detox blend you might like to know is also relabeled as hangover bitters for Christmas and the new year. For, for your occasional um, bash of um, uh, indulgences. Um, so it's, uh, you use a higher and preemptive dose where if you're going out for an evening meal with some alcohol and late nights, you might like to take five mils before you go, five mils when you get home and five mils in the morning. Um, and you can email me and let me know how you got on. <laughs> um, so the next one we consider is the digestive tonic blend. So as, as you can see, the bitters are particularly useful for the digestion. Most digestion tonic blends also need a lot of nervines and soothing. 
So let's look at the bitters first. In red, these are the chamomile, verbena, and angelica. Very nice. Um, these are very gentle bitters, um, not over cooling, um, fairly neutral. The angelica, archangelica, is a little bit warming. It's blended with mallow root, which is soothing for the mucus lining and nourishing. I'll explain that a bit later. Uh, lemon balm is antispasmodic, digestive, nervine. Peppermint is carminative and antispasmodic and tastes nice. Uh, fennel tastes nice and it's anti-colic and antispasmodic. And the meadow sweet again is soothing to the stomach or is stomachic um, and rich in salicylic acid for um, inflammation. So you can imagine if you have a patient with uh, irritable bowel syndrome or diverticulitis in particular, um, can also be very suitable for people with ulcerative colitis or a similar blend and Crohn's disease, but that would depend on whether they're on medication. If they're on medication for autoimmune, they really should um, see a medical herbalist. So just give a time check. I think we'll be about another seven minutes. Um, so the next one that we consider is black walnut and gentian, uh, otherwise known as the parasite blend. Black walnut contain tannins, um, iodine, this is one of the few plants rich in iodine, and naphthoquinones, which are good for worms and parasites. And they add with thyme and marigold, which are very gentle antifungals um, for the nervous system. Wormwood is called worm wood because it's one of the reasons it's indicated is for worms. It's the aromatic digestive bitter, milk thistle and dandelion root as before, the liver enzymes and the bile. Meadowsweet and peppermint and silver birch. Silver birch is um, bitters, diuretic and particularly suitable for joints. Um, and the kind of, uh, uh, so fibromyalgia would be a, a particular indication for the um, silver birch. Okay. Um, and the, this is the, I think this is the, the, the last specific one for the digestion. Um, dock and chamomile, otherwise previously known as the laxative blend. Um, so this is for your patients who have done all the fiber um, and they uh, are um, just not behaving as they should, even though they're doing everything that they, they can and that you've told them to do diet wise. But often the people who can't open their bowels when they go on holidays because they're not sitting on their own potty. Um, it's a lot of nervous system connections and safety and familiarity. So um, we have the nerve, we have the, the bitters. Um, as you can expect, bitters um, release bile and bile is our own natural laxative, which makes this so nice. Um, so dandelion root, chamomile, Turkish rhubarb. Um, Turkish rhubarb is what herbalists use, where the pharmacists use senna. I have a bottle of senna out there and it's probably every two or three years I'd buy another litre um, because it's overstimulating. Between Turkish rhubarb and dock, they both contain anthroquinones, which have the laxative effect, but it's a much more gentle effect. Vervain is a, a cool liver nervine. It goes back to the Druidic times, um, and uh, it will be considered a sacred herb. Um, I love the energetics. It's a whole other um, area of herbal medicine. But balancing all of this, we have the nervines, which are the vervain um, skullcap, um, Scutellaria laterifolia and the chamomile. Burdock is in there as a, a it, it's an, um, it, it, it tones um, and uh, helps the, 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 the feedback up through the loops, through the lymph um, of the extracellular fluid. Remember in the beginning, I think I said that the important part of physiology is the extracellular fluid and cell communication. So that's what you want to fundamentally support. So the laxative blend is very good for um, irritable bowel patients who don't have the alternating um, constipation and diarrhea, they just have the constipation. Um, also, a lot of people have gone through their lives following an adverse childhood. And what's normal for them is to open their bowels every two or three days and it's ingrained since childhood. And these herbs are very good for those patients. And last of all, what in, in conjunction with all of these tonics, 
what I frequently use is slippery elm and mallow. Um, uh, the, the, they're both powders and they have a very rich in soluble fiber, so very good for cholesterol um, and eliminating toxins. And they have healing properties directly, they're mucilaginous, um, and a lot it, with poor immune function, um, you get breakdown of the mucilage as a protective barrier, particularly in the stomach. Nutritious for cells lining the bowel wall, which have a turnover every three days. So you can see how important nutrition is for that. They act like all soluble fibers, they act as a prebiotic, and the dose is up to one teaspoon three times a day. It can be blended with water, blend with porridge, soup, mash into banana, invent your own ways, three teaspoons a day. Um, some patients who have diarrhea with ulcerative colitis or um, Crohn's disease in particular, um, I use three, uh, up to six teaspoons a day. Very, very nice for children um, uh, for constipation. Um, and the other blend, which I won't go into in detail, or will I, is the Relax blend, because behind all of the Vegas tone, I will because if you go back to all of the effects of the Vegas nerve, it includes muscle tension in the neck, um, it includes heart rate variability, um, and even taking those two alone. Um, in the Relax blend, we have Nervines, um, the chamomile, um, lavender, lime flower, passion flower, valerian, and verbena, as you'd expect in a relaxed blend. But we also have Jamaican dogwood, um, which is a painkiller and muscle relaxant in combination with cramp bark, which does everything that it says on the tin and it relaxes muscles. Editor flower is good for the immune system allergies, but the blend, how it blends in here is that it actually helps the muscles to just let go. Um, it, it's a very subtle effect on the, the, the muscles. Um, and all of the ones in red have, of course, what would you expect in a relaxed blend when we're talking about bitters? Lots of bitters effects. So if you're talking about the totality of the vagal tone, then the relaxed blend, which can be used alongside or um, for any of your patients with anxiety, if they don't have digestive problems, if theirs is more heart or muscle tension or whatever. So it more than earns its cape in here. So last couple, how, how can you make these available for yourselves or for your patients? I have the Relax Blend at home. Um, I never leave home without it. Uh, very useful on holidays when you want to relax, especially the first couple of days of your holidays. But you can recommend them to patients to buy directly online. Um, uh, practitioners can become resellers or wholesalers um, and they can also join an affiliate scheme where you would be given a code. You give the code to your patients anytime they order. You would um, attract a small fee um, and uh, that would be a recurring fee. Even if they go back and order, they don't have to put the code in again. You would still attract an, a recurring fee. I introduced this several years ago, thinking that people would be delighted, um, uh, but people have seemed to find it difficult to visualize it. So if you're interested, do, do let us know. Um, you can contact Tara directly for all of these um, uh, possibilities, and that's her email, and you can call her on the, or you can call and leave a message on the telephone. So, as we say, with bitter, um, bitter aperitifs, which are good for the digestion. Cheers. <laughs> and I wish you all good, good wishes in your practice. So stay in touch. These are our Facebook pages. Um, and there's a whole range of ways of keeping in touch with us. And I hope you'll do that. If you, if you keep in touch, we'll let, us, let you know of any events that we have lined up for the future. We don't send a lot of um, uh, unsolicited emails unless there's something of, of, uh, of direct um, recognizance that you might like. Okay, so that's the end of the seminar. Then if anybody has questions, we're figuring out um, how we might be able to answer them for you. If not, they can email me. And if not, you can, if we don't manage to succeed, you can email Tara who's sitting beside me and is a nutritionist. 
And thank you, Tara, for organizing this. It's okay. That's fine. Are we all done? Take an email. Yeah. Okay. Great to make the connection with the NTOI. Um, so do you want to put your head in here, Tara? People like to know who they're going to contact. And uh, yeah, it's been interesting. It's been very good to kind of formulate all the thoughts, put them all together. Um, and I wish you all well in your practice and um, getting all of the good stuff right. Well <laughs> Bye now. Bye.